I wanted to ask you about actions against and VFCs. Typically, uh, in the recent past, you know, you tilted towards imposing severe business restrictions on lenders instead of levying fines. Do you think there is a systemic risk concern here? No, there is no systemic risk. In fact, I would like to emphasize that at the moment, at the system level, the banking sector and the NBFC sector, at the system level, they remain very robust. The various parameters, the regulatory parameters, the various uh, you know, financial indicators of both banking and NBFC sector, they continue to be very strong. So at the systemic level, there is no problem. But when we saw the problem was in the microfinance sector. You see, in 2022, we came out with new guidelines relating to microfinance lending. Earlier, the principle was that cost of funds, the interest rate was supposed to be the cost of funds plus 12% margin, which the you know, MFI, the microfinance lenders were allowed to charge as interest rates. We deregulated that in 2022 because this 12% margin was becoming kind of a benchmark for everyone. Sure. We deregulated that and we expected that competition will result in optimization of the interest rates for the benefit of the borrowers. And who are the microfinance borrowers? They're basically the small borrowers, you know, people who were not, who were not economically very well off. So therefore, we did that deregulation on the expectation that competition will lead to better, you know, sort of lead to uh, reasonable interest rates for the clientele. Now, unfortunately, that has not happened. We have been constantly voicing the Reserve Bank, myself, my colleagues, on a number of occasions, we have been voicing our concern. In fact, even in the last monetary policy statement, I have also mentioned that. Now, what happened is that we, uh, what happened was that in our on-site uh, and off-site supervision, we found uh, uh, you know, a number of NBFCs charging exorbitant interest rates. Right. Interest rates going up to 40%, going up to 45%. Oh. Now, and who is the borrower? The borrower is a, you know, he is a man of small means. Right. And these are not well-off uh, sections of uh, society. And a 40, 45% interest rate or even 25% is a lot. I, I don't want your viewers to assume that if I say 35, 35 is the tolerable limit. I don't, I'm just using it by way of a random example. Now, such excessive interest rates are usurious. And apart from that, some of the charges, like for example, a few days of delay in repayment, the penalties are uh, exorbitant. And sometimes the penalties are not, uh, you know, adequately transparent. So therefore, whatever measure we have taken, it's in the best interest of the customer. We found certain outliers, and even in these outlier, you know, cases we have, where we have taken action, we have been in bilateral engagement with each of them for last uh, several easy. months. Now, when we see that appropriate corrective action is not taken, we engage first. And when we see after several months of engagement that corrective action is not being taken to our satisfaction, then we have to act and protect the interest of the consumers, of the customers. Sure, and then banks uh, have been reporting increased stress in uh, unsecured uh, retail loans. The RBI has raised risk quotes in this segment last year as a warning. Does this remain a concern for you? No, I think after we introduced those uh, additional risk quotes, etc. in November last year, the segments where we imposed these additional uh, restrict, you know, the additional uh, you know, we impose certain additional regulatory compliance requirements, the provisioning requirements. In those sectors, we have seen the, you know, we have seen moderation in credit growth. So that has happened. There are, uh, with regard to other sectors, we are closely monitoring every aspect of the credit market, every subsector of the credit market we are monitoring. As and when something is required, uh, we will act and we will take uh, preemptive action uh, before the problems uh, start building up. RBI's draft proposal on liquidity convergence uh, norms has been in the public domain for a while. Banks have expressed concerns about the potential impact on capital and by extension on credit growth. Uh, is there a possibility of some kind of st softening of your stance on this you see, issue? We have adopted in the formulation of regulations, we have adopted a very consultative approach. And that is the purpose of putting this discussion paper to get comments of the stakeholders to take that into consideration, examine that, and then come out with our guidelines. We have received a number of uh, uh, suggestions and from what the are banks, the suggestions? banks, from uh, you know the 
uh, Indian Banks Association. We have got a number of associations. Naturally, would you like to like, share what they no, are? I mean, there, there are you know, quite a few, I mean, number of associations. So, naturally, they would like uh, some of them, they want uh, this not to be done at the moment. Some of them want a longer period, you know, longer uh, phasing out the entire uh, thing. One point I would like to emphasize is that the discussion paper has arisen from certain potential risks which we see in the economy in today's age of digital banking, online banking, where withdrawal of money from the bank accounts can just happen in you know seconds. Second. We saw some of it happening in February 2000, uh, you know, early 2023 in the United States, where such as you know, a few banks came under stress. Our effort is to Second. mitigate uh, those risks, and Second. it is being done in the interest of financial stability. But we will take into consideration the comments of the banks and other stakeholders, and we'll decide. So that is further talk of inter internationalization of the rupee. Uh, where do you see that going? Um, particularly, you know, Donald Trump, we are in the U.S., a presidential candidate from the Republican Party has indicated that if there is de-dollarization, any country that moves away from the dollar, he's going to impose 100% tariffs. Uh, in such a scenario, how do you balance uh, trade relationships with countries like the U.S.? and also ensure that uh, the RBI's agenda, the government's agenda of internationalization of the rupee countries. You see, internationalization of the rupee should not be equated with an intention for de-dollarization. Both are different things. When we are talking of internationalization of the rupee, what basically we mean to, what we mean is that in bilateral trade uh, settlements between India and another country, a major trading partner of India, our idea is to use rupee as a medium of settlement or the local currency as a mode of settlement. But right now, mostly yeah. dollar is used. So it doesn't yes, mean dollar dollarization. We have, for example, with the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, we have signed an agreement for the local currency settlement of uh, trade, uh, you know, trade settlements to happen through local currency. So importers and exporters on either side, they can do the settlement either by using the Indian rupee or by using the dinar, or they have the freedom to use the dollar. So therefore, when you are doing a settlement bilaterally with your trading partner by using the rupee or by using the local currency of both the countries, you are basically, it's a move towards de-risking your trade because the entire global uh, trade being based on one single currency can lead to concentration risks. If there are wild fluctuations in that particular currency, the rest of the world will have to face the volatility emanating from that. So this is a kind of a insurance, this is a kind of a de-risking your trade from the fluctuations or the volatility of uh, the dollar in certain situations. And it is a flexibility which has been given to the traders on either side. It is not in competition with uh, the dollar or de-dollarization. I think uh, we should not look at it that way. It's basically completely, we are completely on a different uh, track. Uh, the BRICS summit recently concluded and a symbolic BRICS note uh, was launched during uh, the, the summit. What is RBI thinking on that? There has been some engagement. Well, there have been some discussion. I mean, this was a proposal by uh, brought forth by you know, one of the members. There is some discussion, but nothing has been decided. But how do you, how do you um, protect national interests, especially with the kind of geopolitical tension we have with China? You see, a single currency has its uh, problems. The advantage which uh, Euro had was that they had, you know, geographically they were, you know, they were a block. They were all adjoining each other. So therefore, there are many challenges in thinking of a, a cross-country currency system. So, as I mentioned, some proposals, some thoughts were shared by one of the members. We have, nothing has been decided. Okay, and my last question to you is uh, that we are in the US and you were at the World Bank IMF annual meetings. Over the past six years, you've been coming to the US at least twice to attend these meetings, 12 meetings. How, have, how has the impression of India evolved over those past 12 meetings? I think internationally, internationally India's stature has significantly gone up over these years that he was saying. Today, whatever India does, whatever India says, is taken much more seriously than ever before. 
Indian economy is doing well. It's expected to be the third largest uh, economy in 2027. And the overall opportunities, the business opportunities available in India are also considered to be very bright. International confidence, international investor confidence on India has also risen, you know, has increased substantially. So I think in the global round table today, India has a stronger voice than let's say a few years ago. And who would you attribute this to? I think the credit goes to, you know, the credit goes to every stakeholder in the Indian uh, system, in the Indian uh, economic system, in the Indian political system, in the Indian social system. I mean, it's the government, it is the central bank, it is the other authorities, it's the private sector of India, it is the small businessmen, the MSME sector. You know, I think there is a greater amount of optimism and confidence, even in small businesses, even in micro enterprises. Even micro enterprises today are using technology in a big way. So when I say the people of India, I mean all stakeholders in our economic system have facilitated this. Now, that you've been so modest, I was expecting that you would say that the monetary policies and the initiatives taken by the RBI under your regime have contributed to the success, which they have. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure speaking to you. We were in conversation with the Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Shakti Gantadas. Thank you for watching.